time I met him was in his room at a lunch that Srila Prabhupada cooked. Now this time Srila Prabhupada was cooking for all of his new devotee disciples. There were the first 12 initiated disciples minus one. Uh, Kirtanananda was not present at this time. But all the rest of them were. My sister Janki was the first female disciple. So Mukunda warned me, when you meet, we call him Swamiji then, when you meet Swamiji, uh, you can say, Hare Krishna, fold your hands like that. I walked into uh, Srila Prabhupada's quarters and I remember him sitting in a shaft of light underneath a window. And he didn't have a shirt on. He was uh, dishing out prasadam in this corner. So I said, uh, Hare Krishna, Swamiji. And he said, what is your name? I said, Joan. And he said, so you're from your sister's family. When will the other family members come? I said, I'm the only one. No one else is coming. He said, oh. In India, generally, there is a big preparation from the bride's side of the family. Never mind. We will celebrate. So um, that day was my first lunch, and that was a very memorable lunch for a number of reasons. I was a macrobiotic uh, aficionado at that time, and Srila Prabhupada's prasadam was all just power-packed with not only taste, but of course, because his hands had touched it, the way that he served the prasad to the devotees was like no meal I'd ever had. There was so much affection that manifested through Srila Prabhupada's distribution. Another side point, uh, each one of the men ate up to 12 chapatis at a sitting. So that means Srila Prabhupada made a minimum of 144 chapatis for base to start, and then went on with whatever else they wanted to eat. So that was the very first time that I met Srila Prabhupada, that lunch. Well, th th actually, in those days, <laughs> we were so um, inefficient at everything that we did, and, and so uh, incapable of, of knowing the significance of of what initiation meant. And I remember that, of course, at, at our fire yagya for the marriage, uh, we, <laughs> we didn't have enough money to buy butter, so we used margarine. And uh, when Srila Prabhupada tried to start the fire, he picked up a piece of wood and he dipped it in. Beautiful Prabhupada's hands were magnificent, long fingers like this. He picked it up. And held it over the flame, and it went <laughs> He did it again. Over the fire, no, no action. So he looked up very grave and said, oh, this marriage will have a very slow start. <laughs> I was mortified at that. I thought, uh-oh, what have I gotten into now? But uh, yeah, very significant. I suppose at initiation, I do remember very clearly that Srila Prabhupada uh, first gave me the name Kalindi, which is another name of Jamuna. And uh, very quickly, within 10, 12 seconds, he said, no, it is Jamuna Devi. And I said, what does that mean, Swamiji? And he said, uh, the river that Krishna sports in Vrindavan is Jamuna. Morning walks were one of the most relishable aspects of, of spending time with Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada gave us access to spend time with him all day and into the night. But for me, in that early San Francisco period, um, I generally was one of the ones that wanted to be on that morning walk. And one of the early uh, devotees and I used to get up at 2 in the morning and go to Golden Gate Park and pick uh, flowers in Rhododendron Dell uh, make garlands for Srila Prabhupada and uh, then present them to Srila Prabhupada, go on the morning walk, it was in the park. And they were always very, very special moments for us to walk next to your spiritual master, to uh, try to chant Hare Krishna as he is chanting Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada was always chanting Hare Krishna. Uh, his hand was in his bead bag, if he was sitting in his rocking chair or behind his desk when he wasn't writing. 
So certainly the morning walks, they were japa walks, and he walked very briskly. Srila Prabhupada walked like a young man of 25. He, uh, I remember I had wooden uh, yogi shoes between the toes, and uh, the first day I went for a walk with those shoes on, I, they, my feet bled, because uh, they probably was just snapping right along very fast. Yeah, morning walks were glorious with Srila Prabhupada. The first day that I assisted Srila Prabhupada in the kitchen was for my sister's wedding in New York. And Srila Prabhupada cooked in a very small galley kitchen in his New York apartment, uh, both sides uh, counters. And he gave me the singular task of making a very difficult preparation called alu kachuri, which is still my Waterloo, because it's one of the most complex pastries to cook properly. It has to cook very, uh, for a long time without becoming greasy. And that's almost uh, impossible. It's like the uh, elephant through the eye of a needle at the best of circumstances. But because the stuffing for this is mashed potatoes, it is even more difficult. If it's a picachuri that can blow up like a kashta, like a stuffed puri, then it's easy. This is very difficult. Uh, so for nearly eight hours, I was given that singular task of making alu kachuri as well as Srila Prabhupada cooked a 14-course feast for the wedding single-handedly in his kitchen. And in the course of cooking that feast, oh, I made so many uh, mistakes from the very, very first day in his service. Um, the first uh, mistake I made was mm, I had a short, a very short skirt on and little t-shirt and sitting cross-legged and and uh, I said, uh, Swamiji, may I have a cigarette? And he, he popped his head out the corner and he said, go wash your hands. So I went and washed my hands. And uh, so then he explained the four principles in Krishna consciousness, uh, four prohibitions, and no meat eating, no gambling, no illicit sex life, no intoxication. So then short time later, I said, Swamiji, uh, may I have a glass of water? Uh, and he said, go wash your hands. So then he explained the first and simple, foremost principle in cooking is to engage the senses in the service of the Lord, to cook for Krishna with love and devotion, and not think about our senses, our tongue, our sense of smell, the belly. This is cooking for Krishna. So then short time later I said, to, um, Swamiji, it's very hot in here. He was wiping perspiration. Go wash your hands. So then he began a little bit the simplest principles, uh, rudimentary principles of external cleanliness. And then he explained just the simplest touch of internal cleanliness by balancing both of them, do, are we able to engage in the idea of serving Krishna through this art of cooking? So all three things, first day in the kitchen. I always had an attraction to Vrindavan. Uh, and in as early as 1967, I wanted to go to Vrindavan. So I remember one morning, we were on a morning walk with Srila Prabhupada, I believe that was around Stow Lake. And I was walking right next to Srila Prabhupada. And he stopped. He put out his cane, he's leaning on his cane. And he said, So, we have received a letter from Achyutananda, and he wants some men to join his party in Lucknow. So I immediately popped up, said, I'd like to go, Srila Prabhupada. May we go? May Gurdas and I go? He said, mm, yes, maybe we can arrange that. We will start an American house in Lucknow. Then we walked a little farther. Then he, he said, no, you should not go now. And he turned around and he said, someday 
I will take you to India on foot. I will show you India on foot. So from that moment, I was waiting for that, that day that that would come. And that came about three, day, three years later, 1970, October 4th, our party of American and European devotees landed in Bombay. And a uh, party had just, a few days earlier, arrived in Calcutta via Tokyo, some swamis. And in that fall between October Fourth and uh, Srila Prabhupada leaving India uh, in the spring of 71, in so many places, he showed us India on foot, literally walking on foot through the streets. Amen. The first San Francisco temple had certain similarities to the first New York temple, but then quite a few dissimilarities. The first being that in New York there were very few women. In San Francisco, there was almost an equal balance of men and women. So already the chemistry of the temple was different. But in most places, we were like Srila Prabhupada's children. I think the rasa of being children was foremost, although when one studies the letters of this period, we'll also find that sometimes Srila Prabhupada referred to us as his sons and daughters, and sometimes mothers and fathers. He let the role reverse for intimacy. But I think there isn't a devotee from these times, from the early days, mm, who did not feel that every moment with Srila Prabhupada was intimate. Srila Prabhupada had such a way of showing uh, a love and affection through distributing Krishna consciousness that immediately we felt he was the only object of I'd never known what love was until I met Srila Prabhupada. And I think that was true for all of us. We learned to love each other through Srila Prabhupada. And we had very deep, uh, wonderful, transcendental relationships uh, between each other as God brothers and God sisters. And Srila Prabhupada was the father. That was the mood, at least in our San Francisco temple, and that was slightly different from New York. Uh, because, again, there were the mix, it was a mix of the boys and girls. He called us boys and girls. And we were, most of us were in our 20s. Uh, between 25 and 30 was the average age of our San Francisco temple. I remember he was lecturing. We, unfortunately, we do not have tapes from this period. Uh, Srila Prabhupada was recorded, I recorded with my little tape recorder. Um, Gargamuni recorded when he came and Hayagriva recorded. And out of all the recordeds, recordings taken at this time, the only tapes that survived are the Krishna Leela tapes with Hayagriva, with Golden Avatar. So, so many of those have been lost. But he was lecturing on, uh, not the TLC, but the Chaitanya Charitamrita. I remember after some very considerable amount of time, one of the devotees asked, so, who is Lord Chaitanya? And Prabhupada said, oh, such a nice, intelligent question. <laughs> you are so intelligent for asking this question. And this is the subject matter of his lecture for several days. So he was so patient with us, whether we fell asleep or we cried, somehow or another we begin to hear what is this Krishna consciousness? But most of us tasted our Krishna consciousness through chanting, dancing, and feasting. I think that's what we had senses for, for engaging in the most in those early days. Srila Prabhupada liked anything that was well prepared. He tried to teach us technique, procedure, quality, cleanliness, purity in simple ways. He didn't teach um, with a lot of words. He teached by example. And of course, he had uh, personal favorites. At this time, Srila Prabhupada was, uh, had a little tummy, and he was eating immense quantities of rice. Sometimes we would feed a very large tali and you would finish off most of that tally, leave little maha for us. 
but um, the things that he taught us were generally fatty and juicy and sweet and succulent and and very sumptuous. That was the era of sumptuous prasad, because he felt if he could catch us through the tongue, tongue doing two things, vibrating and respecting, if he could capture us through those two ways, then we would begin to taste more and more of Krishna consciousness. So the food was sumptuous and rich. On that day I made um, very Bengali uh, uh, food and served it in a Bengali fashion, uh, arranged on the tali in a Bengali order. And Srila Prabhupada's uh, sleeping room is where he respected. And so he sat behind his desk and Pishima, we gave a small chunky, she sat it just directly uh, opposite Srila Prabhupada on the floor. So as soon as I brought the tallies in and sat them down, Srila Prabhupada you started making these little uh, comical uh, remarks about his sister. And uh, he said, you know, she says it is water, I say it is fat. And I thought, my goodness, he's talking about her weight. <laughs> What's going on? And she was, she, as soon as Prabhupada started kind of being light in his voice, Pishima kind of started chuckling, you know, she started kind of laughing on the side. And he said, all this. And he went like this, he was flapping his arm back. He said, this is fat, he said. But she calls it water. It's not so. And then he started teasing her. He started telling her about, uh, oh, goodness, the days when in their childhood they used to fly kites. And he said, I always used to beat her at kites, he said. And, 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 and back and forth he was speaking very um, brother sisterly about his little sister. So she was laughing, not understanding a word of all this. And uh, in the course of, of all this kind of jesting, I was bringing the chapatis in, relays of chapatis. And when Srila Prabhupada finished his meal, I noticed that every katori, the little round bowls that all of the moist preparations are in and serving a dali, they were now piled one on top of the other, from the largest to the smallest, nearly 12 inches high on top of his, on top of his, uh, on top of his chunky. And when I walked in the room, he took his finger like this and he knocked down the whole stack. And he said, Yamuna Mai Ki Jai. And I said, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. And Pishima said, Gorani Thai Ki Jai. And I said, oh, Srila Prabhupada, you ate everything. He said, now this was a speech that the two of us had with each other. Srila Prabhupada and I had uh, signals for what the quality of the prasad was. Already now things had evolved much from the very early days. And if he patted his stomach, that meant it was third class. If he went like this, second class. If he went like this, first class. This meant excellent. So he said like that, excellent. And in this way, uh, I remember very uh, light, um, sweet, jovial, humorous, uh, first meeting with Pishima, where she didn't understand a word of what was going on, but she truly loved it. She, she was very, um, very fond of Srila Prabhupada, and from that day that I met her until the very last uh, that she was with Srila Prabhupada in 1976, I was also present in Vrindavan. She worshipped him. She just worshipped her brother, and he obviously was very, very fond of with Nagar Kirtan, with, with our congregational chanting, it was the joy of watching Srila Prabhupada pray to Krishna, because I, I think I explained a little earlier that when Srila Prabhupada first introduced the Kirtans in our temple, first he sang. In the evening, on Monday, Wednesday, and fr Friday evenings, he sang Mangala Charana alone. And we all were the rhythm section behind that. Our San Francisco was a very, uh, temple was a very musical place. We had so many instruments and everyone played an instrument. Nobody sat in the temple. Everyone played something. It was a very uh, reciprocal relationship with Srila Prabhupada. And he sat on his Vyasasan and 
He closed his eyes almost always when he sang this Mangala Charana, and he went very deep into prayer. And when he opened his eyes, gray slits moist, and he looked down at us, it was very often as if you felt as if Srila Prabhupada was looking right through you, seeing everything, seeing Krishna. So by simply observing him pray to Krishna, we got an idea of the depth of what prayer was, even in these early days. And then the kirtans were simply rock-out sessions. I mean, we, if one person stood, everyone stood. If another person danced, you danced, because we were all packed right in together. Um, and they were very joyous, beautiful, joyous, long, languorous, sweet kirtans. So through that, uh, japa was a very personal thing, and I don't remember a great deal of concentration or discussion between the devotees about japa. Mostly it was congregational chanting. Generally, Prabhupada would reveal what he thought we needed to know. Some people, their nature is to ask endless questions. But I always felt like a fool asking more than what Srila Prabhupada revealed. Now, if we didn't hear properly, then Srila Prabhupada would have to ask questions, and he would have to repeat. But I found very often the same things that he taught in 1967, say even in regards to cooking, he was revealing that night, uh, that same subject matter in 1976, so many years later. Prabhupada kept Krishna consciousness very simple. And for those of us who engaged in his service, at least my relationship was simply to hear and to follow those instructions personally. When we arrived in London in 1968, uh, our small party decided that the best way to become known, Prabhupada wanted us to make a splash. So the best way to become known would be reach the Beatles because they were luminaries of the time. So we <laughs> agreed that we would make prasadam dishes, apple dishes, to bring to Apple Records every day and see if we could catch someone's attention. So we did that, and uh, the prashad went from the lower floors to the upper floors, so that ultimately everyone tasted some of that prashad, and they became a little addicted to that. So finally, when we stopped uh, sending prashad, we were notified, where is this, uh, where is this uh, Apple Hare Krishna group? So we uh, came to meet them, and ultimately, I think, met George that day. And uh, the first person to strike off a, a serious friendship with George was Shemshender. He and George Harrison just clicked. They were like brothers. Shemshender used to rock back and forth. He was a tall, thin man. He used to rock back and forth. And I remember when he met George, he was rocking back and forth. And George Harrison started rocking back and forth like this. And practically their whole relationship was, I remember, like this, back and forth. Very close friends they became. But ultimately, through that, um, George became aware of, of our chanting. Now, Mukunda Maharaj, now then Mukunda Das, uh, he was a musical genius, um, an arranger and a composer. And he was the leader of our group. We all played instruments. And uh, we, he, he com composed the melody for Govindam. And we used to go about London and and uh, do Sankirtan at various places, the Arts Lab and a macrobiotic restaurant. So we were pretty tight musically. And when George heard that we were into transcendental chanting and uh, chanting Hare Krishna, he really wanted to hear us. And almost right away, we started having really good kirtans with him at his house and said, I want to record this. And so the first thing we did was the Hare Krishna mantra on a 45, and I believe it's Sri Krishna on the back side. That became number one in Czechoslovakia, it was top ten, top the pops in England. And then that led to the larger uh, album, the Govindam album, which the lead cut was the Brahma Samhita, the Govindam prayers. 
So Srila Prabhupada was, of course, very happy with um, the involvement that we were having with the Beatles. We ultimately lived at John Lennon's Tittenhurst estate for much of the fall of 69. And um, when Srila Prabhupada finally did arrive, he was so very pleased uh, of this connection. I believe he called that that Govindam cut um, a Krishna conscious symphony. This is a Krishna conscious symphony. It's very transcendental. He liked that. And in the course of moving the deities, I believe each man to to per deity, I was following. One of them knocked. The curtains were closed. We were behind adjusting the DTs. And one of the persons, somehow or another, inadvertently knocked one of these columns with their elbow. And in as fast as an accident happens in an automobile going 70 miles an hour, everything slowed down into slow motion. And I remember watching this column go out with the speed of lightning. Srila Prabhupada moved all of the paraphernalia with his right hand off the bottom granite step, stepped up with his right foot on the first step, his left foot on the second step, grabbed one column this huge column, the column was at least six to eight inches in diameter, with his right hand and Radharani's hand with his left hand. And I saw on his brow little beads of perspiration, the first time I had ever seen him perspire. And this was such a chivalrous thing that Srila Prabhupada did that I understood what the rasa of chivalry was. And he had that in protecting Radharani. Well, that's one, of, one example of Srila Prabhupada exhibiting a very personal rasa with Krishna, actually saving Radharani from disaster and exhibiting superhuman strength and the alacrity of the movement of the mind. It, it couldn't have been faster. Je anilo prema dana kuruna prachur